Welcome to Comic Book Herald's Cree Annotators. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald, and I'll be interviewing some of my favorite creators in comics about specific runs, graphic novels, or series, looking for their insights on inspirations behind the work. Today, I'm excited to welcome Ryan O'Sullivan, author of Fearscape, one of my favorite comics of the last few years. Ryan, let's kick things off. I want to ask you, how long have you had the approach and narrative tone of Fearscape uh, gestating in your mind? It's a story that to me felt like it was something that may have been, I, it just felt like a, a story you were meant to write in a lot of ways with sort of the command that you had over the narrative. How, how long have you actually been like thinking about this book and it, or was it way more organic than I'm, than I'm describing? No, I think your assessment's quite accurate. I think that the Fearscape was one of the first uh, sort of creator owned or original ideas I had. So it predates some of my earlier work like Voyage Trip or Turncoat. Um, and it, it had always been in the background being played with a little bit more, you know, what about this extra bit? What about this character? What if I tweak the world like this? And it originally started out as this sort of, you know, Joseph Campbell monomyth adoring type thing, you know, with the hero of a thousand faces, the, the realm beyond our own, full of fantastical creatures. But Henry Henry and the the tone of the character and the, the use of you know, formative playfulness and all the sort of horrendous, unreliable narration, spoilers, by the way, uh, that that all came uh, a year or two before I actually started putting it together. So that came later, and that was very much informed by, I suppose, my own desire to sort of push against sort of common thinking in comics. Because one of the things people say, like, you know, this is that old question, isn't it? Where do you get your ideas from? None of us really know. But with Fearscape, mm -hmm. I've got a, a rough guess, and that, that a lot of the current discourse in comics was the art and the writing should never say the same thing twice you know if, if it shows it in the art you should never ever dream of, you know describing it in the narration mm. and i thought to myself well that's massively didactic and i hate anything to do with the rules in art that's just it's i mean you know learn the rules so you can break them and all that but that has become sort of sort of sacrosanct in the comics dialogue uh, discourse sorry so i thought i'd push against that but i'd do so by taking it as far away from each other as possible so rather than you know, if the comment, if the art and the words are not supposed to say the same thing, then let's have them say so, be so far apart that they're almost telling different stories. But the writing is actually <laughs> fighting the art. Yeah, it follows all your rules. It must clearly be doing comics right. To sort of not, not to satirize or mock, but just to show that the uh, the language of comics is, I think, a lot wider in scope than a lot of people realize. Um, and as Fearscape evolved, you know, it became. Uh, less me antagonizing the audience and more me creating a character in Henry. Because I think that, you know, as antagonistic and formally playful as it is, uh, the chief appeal I've heard from uh, from readers and reviewers such as yourselves about Fearscape and about Henry Henry, the appeal is the character's voice and the tone and like the inner you know, humanness or consciousness of him. And uh, I think he's the first... Because I'm a relatively new writer, and I think he's probably the first character that feels fully like human. You know, not every motivation he's got can be traced back to a specific thing in his childhood. You know, he's full of contradictions. Uh, so yeah, I think that answers your question. Uh, I went a bit off topic. It, but... it totally does. That's that's an excellent answer, and I I have a follow up, but I do want to ask before I kind of dig into the specifics of that. Is as much as I enjoy Fearscape, I do find it pretty difficult to summarize. And I'm curious, and I think it could help uh, set the stage a little bit for some of the listeners who might be less familiar with the work. As far as the actual plot points, like there's this, you know, impossibly arrogant literary plagiarist. He uncovers a mystical realm of fiction's greatest fears. It, they don't really do the style and the voice justice. And I'm curious, how did you pitch the book to Vault? Well, um, what what well, was the, your what was your hook? Well, the the pitch was. I would not recommend anyone to pitch the way I did. I sent Vault a 21-page Word document. And oh, Adrian okay. Wassell, insane person that he is, actually read the entire thing and loved it. Um, I happened <laughs> to luck out in finding an editor that was as, you know, off the walls insane as, as I am when it comes to putting these things together. But if I was to sort of figure, like summarize Fearscape in a way that people could you know, quickly hook into it, I would say, imagine something like Sandman but with a protagonist who, you know, Dream is this incredibly inspiring character who says beautiful things and who, you know, everything is heartbreaking. So, yeah, imagine something like Sandman, but with a protagonist who's a bit like Walter White. 
you know, you start out mm-hmm. liking him, and as the story progresses, you know, you slowly start hating him. You know, he starts out as this sort of slightly aloof literary character. You know, as you describe him, you've got a smile on your face. But as you sort of discover the things he does in the latter issues, you know, spoilers. You know, he tries to kill a baby in the last one for God's sake. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah, no, it takes yeah. a pretty dark turn <laughs> that was me essentially saying at the end like no you are all going to dislike him now i don't care like how funny you might find him he's a bad person <laughs> uh, regardless of what traumas he's been through he is ultimately a bad person as well um and yeah i think that that would be how i'd so that's how i saw you know that's, that's the dreaded cross pitch or, or the 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 log line you know sandman but with a protagonist who is similar to Walter White from Breaking Bad or Macbeth, you know, that that's the, the way I look at it. Uh, I, and with, with Fearscape, it's interesting you mentioned that because when we sent out the solicitation for the first issue, like the, the blurb was, you know, a realm beyond our own, full of humanity's greatest fears and once a generation, a storyteller of it. And that sounds mm-hmm. cool, you know, and, and retailers bought it. But then they read it and they were like, this doesn't do it justice. Like, the, that's not mm-hmm. what the book is. And so, so when we came to put the trade together, uh, the back cover blurb just doesn't describe the book. It's just Henry Henry. It's, it's written from Henry's perspective, ranting about how back cover blurbs are a waste of space and that the reader should just pick up the book and read it. And <laughs> all that matters is the tone. And obviously, you know, wink, wink, that was us showing the, the uh, perspective bio what the tone is. So it did work out in the end, thank God. But yeah, I think for the that's why for the, the marketing campaign that we're doing for uh, the not sequel, Honest, A Dark Interlude is, you know, very much more talking about the tone like we did um i think there's a thing on the hollywood reporter where they asked for some words from henry henry and he just refused to describe the book i, I, I reread it recently and it just doesn't describe the book at all now i've no idea if that's smart or really dumb in terms of marketing but it's definitely in my view going to find the right sort of readers for the book you know if you read I that mean, and it entertains you i think you'll dig it yeah yeah definitely i mean i think as a as a fan of the work and as someone who is both like like you said, I'm captivated by Henry Henry's like immediate undercutting of of all literary tropes and techniques, but I'm also simultaneously disgusted <laughs> with with how you know over the top um, arrogant he can be. I think marketing from that voice it definitely connects with me, someone who's read the work, um, and it, it's such a it's such a fun twist on kind of what you're describing that typical back of the book you know, um, yeah. it, almost describing the mythology and the world building and these things that that now get used as sort of shorthand um, to sort of take to take uh, the the common, you know, like understanding out of it and say, no, that's BS. This is <laughs> I'm not going to bother myself with that. It's very fun. Uh, I do quite love that. And I following up on that from the book's opening epigraph, which is a quote that says to open with an epigraph is to declare oneself an echo. <laughs> straight into a text only nine panel grid that is uh as a, a cbh writer riddish babu who's one of my favorite comics writing critics uh, he he called it a diss track for the nine panel grid which is some language i love there's there's this over reliance on the lessons of watchmen that fearscape is calling out it's got the self-aware ability to undercut potential criticism uh everywhere like it, it's absolutely extraordinary what what's your own you know, background? I, I wanted to write a book that if someone gave me a bad review i could say well you know that's just part of it you know he, he criticizes <laughs> yeah. his critics obviously they're gonna hate the book and then i had i had the, all these things planned like for to like to sort of you know if i got a bad review i'd go online and i'd tweet this and go oh they're just upset about this part of the book but all the well, not all the reviews but yeah, a lot of the reviews were great so you know they were all in on the joke so but there was a little bit of me that was like oh, i need to up the ante i need to be even worse to critics now but i thought you know i'd, I'd give them a break sorry i, I jumped in it is it is very funny in that regard oh totally because it, it's almost critic proof i mean it truly if you try to call it out there's a chance it already did so and probably more savagely than than most critics can do <laughs> like it's already it's already part of the text which is awesome um what's your like what's your own background in literary criticism and english studies is that a big part of who you are um or does it just come with the territory of making art um i think it's a bit of both um i studied i mean i don't have any sort of professional background uh, beyond writing in uh, in sort of literature or criticism uh, i did philosophy at university um, but that's probably the, the the extent of my formal education about it but i do i'm mm-hmm. a sort of you know what they call a voracious reader i hate that terminology but you know i read a lot of books essentially and um mm-hmm. i did that typical thing a lot of people do in their 20s where you know they they start wanting to be well read, so then they read just all the classics. Don't yeah. read contemporary fiction, and I got that out of my system, and now I'm sort of reading all sorts. And um, 
in a certain ways, some of Henry's aspects of me pastiching the person that I used to be. Um, he's definitely someone who uh, read a lot back in the day, but doesn't anymore because he's read all the books that matter, in his opinion. Mm -hmm. you know, what, why should he read the latest bestseller when he just read Paradise Lost again? That would be his justification. And of course, he hasn't read Paradise Lost. He's just read the Wikipedia page because he's smart and doesn't need to read the book. And you know, it becomes this sort of spiral of neurosis. <laughs> uh, but no, in terms of my background, I just really enjoy literature and uh, I've always been drawn to comics because it's a fringe medium. Uh, I really enjoyed the comics of Alan Moore and you know Warren Ellis, people who pulled, and Neil Gaiman, as I said, who pulled literary elements into comics mm. um, to take comics, to, to treat them as a little bit more than just escapism, uh, to say, you know, this, this is a a medium and a form and it can be used to tell all sorts of stories. Not that there's anything wrong with escapism, you know, I read absolute bucket loads of fantasy books you know i'm all about escapism but um i do like to create stuff that is uh, a bit challenging to the reader uh, and i think that escapist stories don't challenge us and I've, one of the things that i quite like the way i describe the the approach i take to putting a story together is i like to create a bunch of islands and then rely on the reader to put the bridges between them so anytime i get any sort of feedback uh, creative feedback suggesting, oh no, you should have put a bridge here so people can understand it. I'm like, well, that kind of goes against the the uh, the idea there. And I'm not a big believer in the the death of the author. You know, there are specific bridges that should be put down. It's not entirely up to the the reader, but you know. Mm -hmm. But if a reader discovers an incredible bridge that I never thought of, I obviously take credit for it. So <laughs> then it was there the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when you say a pun by accident, you always have to take credit for it. Right, right. Oh, pun not intended, but it, yeah. secretly you're pretending you did. Um, along the same lines of of the classics and of challenging readers, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses is a is a major reference point through the work, and I personally can think of like no better example of the sort of the almost impossible to read yet like critically bulletproof, you know, novel, you know, hailed as as this incredible work. Um, I, I read it in college and I read it twice. Uh, in a class so I had Goodness. loads of help to understand it so I feel like I I will and I will bring that up whenever I can just to mm -hmm. get those those literary merit points um but oh, there's a little oh, there's a thing on Twitter recently where loads of people yeah. are saying here's the here's the here's the six comics I'm reading right now here's the six books I'm reading and just to be a bit antagonistic I sort of took a picture of Ulysses infinite jest the critique <laughs> of pure reason and what was the other one there's another, there's another I basically just got all the complicated books and put them in a pile and then I yeah. put a Star Wars novel on top I was like oh, it's casual reading for uh, I didn't get any abuse for it thank god but uh, that's awesome need that little bit of escapist uh, Star Wars yeah. after your and after I didn't your realize that like, half of comics was tagged in it so hopefully I haven't pissed anyone off but it was uh, <laughs> it was pretty funny <laughs> that's good um thematically i did think ulysses was also a good call out because particularly there's a lot of wordplay in the book you know I, I think of ulysses there's that recurring word and world and kind of all the the ways that words can become a world and, and in the simple thing but it gets used so often it's it's a really fun trick i why this particular text as a touch point was there was there something more to it or did it just feel like yeah this is this is the book henry henry would uh would use here well, it, it's a bit of both again. I, it is definitely a book he'd use because it's considered, you know, if you want to impress someone, you say you've read Ulysses. Or if you say you've read Ulysses, people say, no, you haven't. It's ultimately, it's just a bloody book. Thousands and thousands of people have read it. It's not impressive or unimpressive to have read the thing. You know, most mm -hmm. use a guide. I did. Um, but in terms of, but Henry definitely hasn't read it. So, but he would use it as a <laughs> reference. Um, and there was those bits in it that are specifically referred to. Uh, there's even that one page where it's literally on his bookshelf and he's talking about it. Um, and there is, as you said, you know, a link with the, the wordplay. You know, Joyce is obviously famous for it. And there's also some thematic similarities between uh, Fearscape, um, Ulysses, and also A Dark Interlude. A lot of that to do with Stephen Daedalus's theory on art and how it links in with uh, Shakespeare and Hamlet. The idea that Hamlet... Uh, I don't want to give too much away about A uh, Dark Interlude now, but I'll, I'll go into it. Um, Shakespeare... And this is something that Harold Bloom plays around with a little bit as well. You know, I thought I'd find the sort of the biggest, sort of puffiest literary critic and see what I could pull. But yeah. in a sense, it's it's the idea that um, literary influence can move backwards through time, uh, and that was something I wanted to play with. And Ulysses was a good touch point for that because it pulled mm. so much on Shakespeare and 
a lot of traditional sort of Western literature. And if Henry was going to sort of pull off that, then I'd want to sort of have a, a strong sort of foundation for it. It was either Ulysses or the Bible, and I didn't particularly want to do something with religious overtones. Um, but on another note, I, when Ulysses first came along, it sparking the modernist movement, there was a slight thought in my head. And this was me thinking, you know, has Henry Henry transcended the page? Has he become you know, part of our world? Well, I started thinking, well, what if Fearscape could, you know, for comics, excite a certain sort of way of thinking in the way Ulysses did for novels? But, you know, that's a, that's a big sort of very, very egotistical thing to think. But, you know, we're egotists when we write. We put things down. We think we should get paid for it. And we think people will like it. Um, sometimes that happens. And but it is the egotism that gets you to start, I think. So yeah, that so Ulysses is definitely interlinked with the book, um, yeah, in a massive way. And I think Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare and Ulysses are the two biggest influences on Fearscape and the Dark Interlude, uh, and a lot of the sort of tone of some of Nabokov's books as well, sort of Pale Fire, Lolita, that sort of thing. I think they're the biggest influences. I don't really like to talk about influences because then it sort of turns the, the things into sort of you know paint by numbers. But uh, but yeah, those are, those are the things I sort of they're my favourite things to read you know hamlet and ulysses are two of my favorite pieces of art uh, so incorporating them somehow into this would have been good and with the dark interlude being uh, a sequel in denial it's also playing with the idea of all of literature being one long sequel to shakespeare and that's that's the something that i've been sort of looking at there's a, a poet called ted hughes who wrote a book uh i've just picked up i think it's like the goddess of being or something and it's all about the idea that all of Shakespeare's plays are one long single narrative. And every time a character dies in the play, they transcend to the realm beyond. So it links in with sort of Kantian metaphysics and all this good stuff. So yeah. I thought I could sort of distill some of that thinking, some of that, uh, you know. I mean, it's essentially just a really complicated Reddit theory. You know, what if all of Shakespeare's stuff was, you know, <laughs> what if Darth Jar Jar? So I thought, well, yeah, that's true. But what if I set out with the intention of creating something like that? And that was how it sort of all formulated in my head um so yeah yeah that's in a roundabout way i think that's answers your question which i've now completely forgotten uh, no i think that ambition is is a big part of the appeal of of the fearscape as the sort of mythological realm is when you start because again definitely i am a i come from you know a literary nerd background i've had exactly the experience you're describing of oh i'm just going to read all the classics now and and going yes. through that <laughs> myself whereas now like generally i read a lot of x-men comics <laughs> you know so like <laughs> i've also moved out of it a little to a degree but it's still very much a part of me um and i i do find it that idea of the ongoing nature of literary connections and and of an author yourself both in fearscape and dark interlude taking it seriously but also like henry henry then amplified to the nth degree on his own terms thinking he can be the one to do that right just like yeah. that that level of ambition is is completely fascinating to me how hard is it to shake henry henry's voice um as a critic as you're writing these things like do you find yourself almost second guessing or critiquing your work or is that actually part of the fun for you i think we're our own biggest critics because uh, we're constantly self-editing you know when you write a line you just you know you imagine every when you've had a certain number of reviews you are very aware of what certain people will think or you'll have certain friends who you show your scripts too frequently um, and you'll know what their feedback is likely to be so you put a line down you've got their voices in your head already critiquing it and then you've got to push against that and put down what you think is right and it's a constant case of, of second guessing some lines are given to you out of the blue some lines you have to spend hours with and then when you look back at them you can't tell which was which that's the that's the way it works um but in terms of keeping henry henry his mind sort of out sort of keeping his mind out of mine um that's interesting you say that because he is a very powerful voice and i have noticed in some comics when they have a strong character sometimes that character can you know get away with the story uh, you can sort of you know take control and it all goes off down a, an odd corridor so what my way of sort of overcoming that is to make sure i'm quite strict with my plot structure so i'll sit down with you know all my bloody sort of how to write books and make sure that the uh, the structure is solid and is uh, in place that that way when henry starts you know going off the rails as he occasionally does 
uh, I, I'm able to rein him in. You know, sometimes when you're exploring a character and how they're acting in a situation, uh, it will feel right for them to go completely off the rails and you just go with it. But having that structure in place to begin with is really important. And that's one thing I think uh, that's probably the most important part of writing for me is structuring something. Um, yeah. The idea of, I know there's people that can just sort of go off, was it, they're called pantsers or whatever it is, you know, the idea that they can just sort of go with the flow. I'm not sure I can do that with something like comics just because the medium is so economical. There's so few pages. Uh, it's almost, it's in the same way that poetry, you need to be sort of rigidly precise with every word, every every syllable, you know, the, the rhythm of the line and such. I think comics is very similar uh, just because it is such a, a smallish medium in terms of page size. So, yeah, that's how I keep Henry in check by limiting how much he can move around. For sure. For sure. I think that makes sense. Along those same lines, how do you script for Andrea Muti and Vladimir Popov, uh, art and illustration and colors here, with captions that are frequently very insular? Um, do you prefer more or less detail for the sequences? I know you already addressed, you know, you were very intentionally trying to write, you know, we have all of Henry's thoughts and, and critiques going on as, <laughs> for example, there might be this huge, lush, you know, again, like mystical realm in the background uh how how is that process in terms of working with these you know obviously extremely talented uh, collaborators it's great i mean with with andrea and vlad uh i am absolutely a control freak and they have to suffer through me unfortunately um <laughs> and i adore them for it there have been times when andrea has been so annoyed with me he sent me an email entirely in italian and but you know he's the uh, <laughs> which which was one of the funniest things I've ever encountered in comics. But no, he, he's he's a really close friend now because of the, you know adversity draws you close to people, and ultimately they're two very passionate creators. Um, so the the work they put into it, you can see on the page. I think that the the way to because it is such a specific story and because the art and the writing does fight. Um, I think as long as you. With, with Vlad and Andrea, especially, when, you know, as long as I get them on board with the narrative direction of the work, you know, here's why we're doing this, here's why we're doing this, um, they always, always deliver really good stuff. And I think, you know, Vlad's colors, because he's having to do real world and he's having to do fantasy, and he manages to merge. And there's some pages that show the crossover, and he always manages to have it flow so well. Um, you know, that so the, the sort of narrative cohesion of the page is never stopped. You know, he's, he's there are some colorists in comics who, um, can view the page as like their canvas for to show off their coloring and he does show off his coloring but it's always in service to the narrative direction and i think that's mm -hmm. yeah he, he never tries to you know i like comics where every single thing becomes part of the whole i don't like it when any individual part sort of screams for attention and uh, unless it's supposed to obviously and vlad is amazing at that and andrea is you know he manages to capture the specific emotional beats so well like the, the facial expressions of Henry and of Jill in some of those scenes, he just, yeah, he's really, really good at that. And that's why I think uh, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the scenes hit so hard is just because he's managed to absolutely nail the specific emotion I had in my head when I wrote the line and he sort of mm. feels it too. Uh, so yeah, I, I adore working with those two and uh, not just because they're talented, but also because they put up with me being very micromanaging, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a book that needs to that. I think, um, I think I, I have done comics that are more laissez faire, but I don't think with Fearscape and the dark interlude that's possible just because of the nature of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can see that for sure. One of the things that really stood out to me as well is in this book, you know, you're including a lot of unique design decisions, um, often revolving around like the placement of captions and text. So Henry's, own sort of I, I know it's it is it's been critiqued so many times in fearscape by henry henry that i feel like i can't say it without being a parody but he's a very unreliable narrator <laughs> like i have to call him that i don't know what I'll, what other term to use and a lot of times captions are doing this right where um mm -hmm. joel's bursting into a scene and he's you know, writing over what she's actually saying with the captions of what he would prefer her to be saying which is a yes. hilarious way to do that um there's also i think a really cool example where the muse shows up for the first time and there's a caption over her face because her beauty is indescribable, right? No words could express her beauty in that moment. I, I love yeah. those little tricks. I'm curious, are you looking to, I, I hope we see more of this in a dark interlude as you move into the next stage of this um, comic. Are you looking mm -hmm. to sort of expand those types of things as you work or 
do you kind of just let them come to you as you're scripting or like or are you actively researching hey what are some other things we can do that really elevate the the style and the structure of how we're making this comic i think you it's an, it's a it's something that is that is constantly on my mind what you've just described the the, the thinking behind it um but I've always thought that the formative playfulness, you know, the sort of you know, showing what the medium can do, is always in service to the character story at the heart of it. Yeah. You know, Henry doing all of that stuff, it's not to show off that you know I, as a writer and the team as as artists, can make a book that does this. It's no, it's to show that Henry Henry is unreliable, or that he thinks that his words are more important than someone's face when describing that face, even though he also thinks his words, you know, it's, it's utter nonsense. But it's all from the root of the character. And as the story progresses, some of that formalism might fall to the wayside a bit because, you know, that's not the focus anymore. Or perhaps in the sequel even, you know, perhaps, who knows, he might be trying to be earnest. You know, he might be doing his whole new sincerity David Foster Wallace style of, you know, it's his redemption arc, honest. Uh, who knows, that might be what's coming. <laughs> but okay. So there might not be any formalism. You know, there's always the, th the thought that perhaps the art would entirely be truthful and all the narration boxes would be truthful and the reader would be like, is Henry actually good now? And, I'm, I'm, and the idea of making them think that when in the last issue of Fearscape he tried to kill a baby, I'm like, wow, you guys really just take the bait. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's, it's all in service to the arc Henry's on. And as well, there's a consideration that I don't want it to become a gimmick. You know, I don't want it to be a gimmick that there's always stuff covering panels or that there's always explosive formalism. I think that as long as it all ties back to the character and his journey and the emotional moments of what he's going through, uh, that's you know, that's just how it is. But as I'm writing, I come up with these like cool little things that can be done as we go. Mm -hmm. So uh, that tends to be organic. Uh, Very cool. But it's it's as with most things, it's it's a uh, it's a process of working out what works on the page and tying it back to the character journey of Henry because. That's ultimately how it all focuses, and also Jill as well. She's she's got a much, much more prevalent arc in the sequel. Mm. Not sequel, not sequel. Sorry, sorry. Edit that out. <laughs> the not quite a sequel, right? Exactly. So since you're mentioning it, I guess let's let's touch on that. So a dark interlude is coming. It has been announced as a again not a sequel in the words mm -hmm. Henry Henry has derided the the cultural merit of sequels in the in yes. the quite excellent. We would never allow uh, himself to something so base. Exactly, exactly. What can you tell us about uh, the direction of A Dark Interlude? And uh, as well, just like some timing and, and when readers can expect some more. Well, it hasn't been solicited yet, but I think issue one's due out in November uh, when okay. all the shops are open again. And it takes place immediately after Fearscape uh, with all the characters from Fearscape. And you know the problem we have now is that Henry Henry is humanity storyteller, and it's humanity storyteller's responsibility to overcome our greatest fears on our behalf in the fearscape. Mm -hmm. But Henry Henry's now in a mental health hospital because of the you know, how the first book ended. He, he wasn't in the best place. He's still narrating, but he's in a hospital. So we're watching the other characters as they go about their business in the fearscape with the fears becoming more and more powerful with nothing to stop them. Mm -hmm. uh, so... The characters then, you know, the, the hero of a thousand faces, the the new muse, Petrarca, and, and a bunch of others have to start looking at alternative methods to manage the fears. And it's a look at, you know, I wanted. It's called a dark interlude because the characters are going through a dark time. A lot, you know, the world they're living in isn't so happy, and they can't quite put their finger on why. And it's them trying to figure out a way to to get out of it if they can. Uh, and I think Jill is the key to all that. Because if you remember, the muse was looking for her father originally in the first book to become the storyteller. Right. Uh, and she got that wrong by picking Henry. So who knows? Maybe she should have been looking for Jill all along. But mm. uh, that's the direction we're going with it. And there's some of the characters in the Fearscape think it might be a good idea to bring back an older storyteller from back in the day. Someone who used to be one of humanity's biggest and brightest. And, you know, I think we've already talked about him a fair bit. So I won't say anything for the sake of spoilers, but, you know, an old friend returns. Very nice. Very cool. I, the Fearscape to me was, I guess, almost secondary ultimately in, in my read of the first, um, the first narrative here, just because Henry Henry and his, you know, quest was so captivating, I think. Um, I'm curious now as we move into a dark interlude and as those characters in that realm 
sounds like it's going to take a little more prominence. And obviously, just you have the time now uh, with more issues to potentially expand it a little bit. How are you looking to define sort of the the mythology of this realm or the the influences? Like, for example, there's the hero of a thousand faces, and it's kind of got this Joseph Campbell, you know, influence style, like a hero's journey, sure. right? Type like like literary. Are, I guess my question is: Are these are the inhabitants of the Fearscape almost literary devices or things mm-hmm. that have come from literary influence, or is it broader than than the way I'm describing it? Uh, I think I'm trying to look at it as a a starting point for all stories. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying not to pull on any specific myth, but I'm thinking what formed the myths. And I'm trying to create it based on that, whilst only using as much as I can existing authors. So yeah, Petrarca is obviously a, a big uh, poet from back in the day. Mm. So using people like him, there'd be a lot more of characters of, of his ilk cropping up. Um, but the idea for the Fearscape, I wanted to explore, because as I, as I finished the first book, I realized that the idea that the Fearscape helps humanity overcome its greatest fears, that goes against the idea of art for art's sake. Because of, you know, if art exists to help humanity get better, then that means that art has a specific utilitarian function. And I thought, well, I don't actually agree with that in the slightest. I've, st- I've created a, a, a narrative conceit that I completely disagree with. What am I going to do? So I thought, well, what if we started exploring the idea that perhaps the foundation of the Fearscape itself was you know, perhaps not accurate? Uh, and as I started thinking about this, I became very happy that it was called Fearscape. Uh, and I'm definitely not going to mention more of why that is. Um, but yes, I think, and that's why I'm, I'm just sort of mumbling over my words. I'm being very careful not to, because because it's not out yet. I'm excited to talk about it, so I'm trying to make sure I don't actually spoil the entire bloody thing. Yes, but yes. I, I'd want to to play with the idea that perhaps the fearscape itself isn't isn't a hundred percent correct in the way it functions, and that maybe maybe you know Henry was picked because the system's bad. Um, and maybe Arthur was going to be picked. You know, he was a terrible person as well. He was going to be picked because the system's bad. Yeah. So maybe it's going to look at how the system could change, and that has, that again has allowed me to play with classic literature. You know, is it right that these sorts of books are considered the canon? Who decided that? Is it right that we are mm-hmm. all living in Shakespeare's shadow? Should the influences we all have be the influences we all have? That's the stuff I'm starting to play with with the Fearscape, and that all ties in with Henry. And the pro- sort of problematic, not problematic, but the sort of messed up mind he's got. So it all links back to Henry ultimately. Um, and the, but the yeah, the, exploring the fearscape in that way is is something I want to look at just to sort of see what well, is very didactic and it's giving a function to art right now. How could we tweak that, or how could we lean into that? You know, in this in this era of you know a lot of new things being published right now, are focusing on. Sort of progressive messages, or sort of diverse ideas. Maybe art should have a utilitarian function. That you know, it, it's it's not as clear cut as as we might think. So it's nice to explore, um, and definitely links in with Ulysses and Harold Bloom and all that sort of stuff too. Mm-hmm. That sounds super fascinating. Well, I'm I'm really excited for Dark Interlude. I'm looking forward to the series very much. Um, I would recommend everybody check out Fearscape. Before then, on my end, is there any other? work on the horizon or things that you want to plug um everything i'm working on at the moment hasn't been announced so i can't really mention it uh sure. just trying to think yeah i would say keep an eye on uh, on vault because they've got uh, three other white noise titles coming out um by you know my my uh, the boy band i'm a member of white noise the the, the crew um, yeah so that's Dan Waters, Ramavi, and Alex Pagnadal. We've all got books coming out with Vault this year uh, as sort of the second wave of the White Noise books. A Dark Interlude is one of those. And um, can I ask a little bit about White about White Noise? Yeah, so it's, it's a, that's a I'd, re- I'd recommend of... those books definitely. Oh yeah, by all means. Ooh. Cool. It, it's a collective of, of a bunch of writers, and, and is it comics creator specific or is it broader than that? Uh, we're all just making comics right now, but we have done some TV stuff, and I know that we're look- a bunch of us are looking to get into prose. So we are comics currently, but looking to branch out. 
Cool. How do you all, how do you all interact? Um, is it kind of a, like a, a writing support group, <laughs> you know, like bouncing <laughs> off each other for, for criticism and ideas and, and help uh, well, things like that? It's, it's a Facebook, I mean, we're all friends. So it's, it, it kind of became a thing organically. You know, we're friends. We've got a Facebook chat group where we chat all day, not all day, but every day on it, you know, yeah. just sort of, you know, what we're up to that day, you know, what, what we've done well, what we're upset about, if there's anything we're upset about, that sort of thing. And then from there, it grew into, you know, could you take a look at the script, dude? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Hey, this, this publisher is looking for, oh, cool, I'll send them a message. And, you know, it sort of became that. Yeah. And then it, that culminated, not, not culminated, but, you know, it led to uh, us working collectively with certain publishers. Like a whole bunch, we did a whole bunch of stuff with Titan. Um, when we did some of our image books, we had sort of connecting covers that had the White Noise logo on. Uh, we've done. We're doing two um, sort of wave of books with uh, Vault Comics now. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we're all sort of you know, playing around in different places, and it helps. I think it helps to have sort of with there being so many publishers now. I think it helps to have a bunch of creators that are sort of unified, regardless of where they are, because it lets you know if if you like one of our books, you'll probably like all of them. And the yeah. approach, and we've got a similar approach. You know, we're all massive readers of literature. We like putting that stuff into our work because uh, we like the idea of dense comics. You know, not every comic has to be you know, minimal on the text, and, and, and which is a, the current hive mind thought. Yeah, we like the idea of dense comics. You have to sink your, te sink your teeth into. Uh, yeah. That's the stuff I love reading. You know, that's the old rule, isn't it? You write what you want to read. Um, and White Noise has been has been uh, good for that. So yeah, it's a, it's a group of friends who are making comics together. Who realise that they're stronger together, and one of the benefits as well is I've got three really talented writers who look at all my scripts, so I'm always happy about that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds nice. Cool. All right, thanks so much, Ryan. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, unless there's anything else you want to plug, quick. Anything you can think of? Uh, I want to plug this guy called Comic Book Herald. He's got a really good website, really good reviews. What was the name? Comic Book Herald. Have you heard of him? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was so like when you didn't respond straight away I was like oh shit that just bombed I just bombed at the end <laughs> but no I'm, I'm glad it's just a mic, mic <laughs> no thanks for the plug much appreciated Everything.